Fires across the Amazon continue to rage while social organizations condemn the Brazilian government's lack of action. Demonstrations held across Argentina in protest against President Macri's austerity measures. And Latin American refugees are forced onto the streets by French authorities. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South. I am Doris Polo. Thousands of wildfires in the Brazilian Amazon are raging as environmentalists warn of an impending global disaster if the blaze is not brought under control. The far-right president Jair Bolsonaro has said Brazil lacks the resources to fight the flames. Over 50% of the nearly 73,000 fires in Brazil since January this year has occurred in the Amazon. That's an 80% increase on the same period in 2018. The neoliberal policies of President Bolsonaro have been cited as contributing to the growing problem. We need to strengthen the Brazilian Institute of Environment and Renewable Natural Resources, strengthen the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, promote the development of sustainable projects in the Amazon, strengthen the forest code, and especially change this ignorant discourse that deforest in the Amazon brings some kind of benefit to the Brazilian population. Meanwhile, Brazilian environmental activists have dismissed President Bolsonaro's claims that non-governmental organizations are behind the fires. They said that contrary to his allegations, the fires are a result of deforestation conducted under the government's harmful environmental policies, which has led to an increase in mining, logging and agricultural activities in the Amazon. It is immensely absurd Bolsonaro's comments blaming NGOs for Amazon fires. The fires are the consequences of a policy of environmental devastation, of support for agribusiness, of increasing pastures. So we know that it is an absurdity to distract the media. We need to denounce increasingly that he doesn't represent us. He doesn't know what is happening in the country. He's making use of pain and people's anxiety against the system to preach more hate, more intolerance, more death. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brian Mier, brings us more. As thousands of forest fires continue to burn out of control in the Amazon rainforest, Far-right President Jair Bolsonaro is trying to create excuses and deflect attention from the issue. The first thing that happened is when a smoke cloud coming from over a thousand kilometers away from burning forests in the Amazon caused the city of Sao Paulo to turn completely dark at three in the afternoon this Monday, his environmental minister tried to say that it wasn't caused by smoke, that this was a, a freak weather incident. However, satellite photos that scattered across the internet immediately proved that he had been lying to the Brazilian people. So the next thing that President Jair Bolsonaro tried to do is blame international environmental NGOs for causing the forest fires, which he said they, they were doing in a cynical fashion to try and get more funding. Now, that he, had, he presented no evidence for this, and there's never been any evidence presented anywhere in the world that the World Wildlife Federation or that Greenpeace has started forest fires. So uh, this also fell on deaf ears. Meanwhile, protests are beginning to be planned all over Brazil. There are going to be protests in Sao Paulo on Friday and protests in a dozen other cities across the country on Saturday and Sunday against Jair Bolsonaro's attempted genocide against indigenous populations in the Amazon and against his attempted destruction of the Amazon rainforest, which provides 20% of the oxygen to the world. That was Brian Mayer with that report. Now, earlier we were joined in studio by Carmen Yossi, scientific director at Ecociencia, as well as a member of the Coordination of Indigenous Organizations in the Amazon Basin. She says millions of hectares of forest could be affected by these fires. In any case, I mean, we are talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares. We could be reaching after all this uh, said and and the fires can be uh, stopped, probably millions of hectares, we don't know yet. Uh, 
And the effect of that is terrible. It's simply terrible because on the one hand, we don't have to forget that in any second that there are people living there, indigenous communities living in extensive uh, areas of these um, uh, forests, uh, the Amazon forests. And, and as I was saying also, there is um, um, a transformation basically that it becomes or get in place um, with uh, different uh, aspects of the structure of the forest changing so much that they will be much more uh, prone to fires in the future. Not to say how many uh, populations of species we can be losing at this point, not to mention the terrible um, pollution of the airs causing all sorts of um, um, health issues for the populations directly affected and, and farther uh, beyond as we can see uh, of the Amazon area itself. Yose also said that in the case of Brazil, key people in the government are actively denying science, putting the Amazon, its people and other inhabitants in danger. There is something going on in terms of, of an explicit intention of uh, turning the Amazon, which is for now still mostly covered with forests, in areas for um, agro-industry, uh, timber extraction and other um, extractive activities as well. It is clear that in the case of Brazil uh, specifically, you can see um, a government, a president and, and all his ministers uh, that are basically denying any evidence that is provided by science and, and that is the problem. I think that there are uh, scientists, um, you know, uh, working in the Amazon and, and proposing uh, several ways of really still developing in a sustainable way, uh, creating um, a, a income for people, uh, for the country, and so forth, but using other means to do that not this simple extractivist and, and this is kind of even one of the ministers of Bolsonaro was uh, a, saying um, a few weeks or months ago that uh, seeing basically that the Amazon or saying that the Amazon was an improductive region and that basically it needs to be turned into a productive region but only uh, through the models that uh, we are seeing now. And the fires in the Amazon have also affected more than 70% of Paraguay's protected forests. More than 20,000 hectares of forests inside the Tres Gigantes Reservation have been affected, according to authorities, as the situation has become critical for nearby communities. Environmentalist NGO Guira Paraguay said winds of up to 52 kilometers per hour have spread the fires and destroyed an important part of the country's biodiversity. In other news, Bolivia's central government, in collaboration with local governments, has launched a massive operation to put out wildfires that have already consumed hundreds of thousands of hectares near the Brazilian border. More in this report. Massive wildfires in the Amazon raised an alert for the Bolivian government, which in response created an environmental emergency cabinet. In the town of Robere, in eastern Bolivia, firefighting efforts will be aided by the use of a tanker plane. I have told the finance minister to lease a 747 super tanker to put out the main fires raging in the east of Bolivia. The super tanker is set to arrive in Bolivia on Thursday and will kick into action early on Friday. The plane, which has a holding capacity of 150,000 liters of water, will be operating over the Brazilian border. The defense minister has also been ordered to rent five smaller planes used for fumigation, which will also be used to put out the fires. We will even acquire 10 if the need arises. 
On land, over 1,000 members of the military, along with 500 police officers and firefighters, as well as dozens of volunteers, are battling the massive blaze. Over 30 tanker trucks are also being used to provide water. 25 doctors have also been deployed to provide aid to those who've been affected by smoke blanketing the region. In the Chiquitania, there are 1,600 hectares of crops. The rest is over 70,000 hectares of grass, as cattle raising is the main productive activity in the region. Therefore, the grassland is what's being burned. So we have decided to purchase 15,000 rolls of livestock food, as each roll is made up of 250 kilos of food. The firefighting operation includes the distribution of 61,000 veterinary kits and the deployment of nearly 200 veterinarians and agronomists. On top of this, a number of animal shelters will be set up. Still to come, the motion to impeach the Haitian president has been rejected. Stay with us. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. On Monday, only on Venezuela. Welcome back. Social organizations, trade unions, and progressive political parties are demonstrating across Argentina against the policies of the President Mauricio Macri. Demonstrators are condemning the government's austerity measures, which are causing a growing hunger problem in the country and are hosting people's kitchens in public spaces, including a massive gathering at the Buenos Aires Obelisk. Protesters are also calling for a national strike, a plan to fight against planned salary cuts and better living and working conditions. Our correspondent Edgardo Esteban is at the protest in Buenos Aires. A day of protests is taking place across the country, organized by social movements in defense of the most vulnerable parts of Argentine society. The crisis has deepened as a result of the peso's devaluation following the president Mauricio Macri's party's loss in the primary elections earlier this month. Social movements have gathered at the obelisk in Buenos Aires to give up food being cooked here. They're doing this to make the situation more visible and demand an immediate solution. Despite the austerity measures that have been implemented, there haven't been any options for organizations such as soup kitchens or subsidized sectors that work to alleviate the problems caused by a lack of jobs. On August 30th next week, the Minimum Wage Council will be meeting to analyze and discuss salary adjustments. They will also be discussing the difficulties that the most vulnerable are enduring, the majority of whom are without work. That was Edgardo Esteban with that report. Interpol has issued a red notice for the Colombian FARC Senator Jesus Santrich. Santrich left his security team and disappeared early in July, but there was no indication he doesn't remain committed to the peace agreement signed in 2016. 
After his disappearance, the FARC released a statement saying that the party is convinced support for the peace agreement is the correct path. However, there were concerns about Santrich's persecution by the reactionary government of President Ivan Duque. At least 160 FARC members have been murdered by right-wing paramilitary forces since the agreement was signed. A red notice is not an international arrest warrant, but rather a request for assistance in locating and extraditing an individual. The motion to impeach Haiti's president, Jovenel Moise, has been rejected. The request for Moise's indictment was turned down in the parliament after three deputies voted for and 53 against with five abstentions. The vote was taken after several delays which caused the debate to run into the early hours of Thursday. Since February, Haiti has been the scene of massive and deadly protests by demonstrators, demanding the resignation of Moise and his administration amid major corruption allegations against the president. Barbados's government is set to abolish the use of paper immigration and customs forms for persons entering the island. From September 1st this year, there will be a full transition to the use of 48 automated passport kiosks at the Grantley Adams International Airport. A trial run was introduced in 2018 for residents and CARICOM nationals. Apart from the environmental benefits of eliminating paper forms, the digital system seeks to cut down the length of time time it takes for passengers to get through the airport. Public sector workers in Trinidad and Tobago came in for a heavy knocking from the Prime Minister who says that many of those employed in the public service are unproductive but make the most noise when the pay is late. Dr. Keith Rowley called on the police commissioner to improve the services management and accountability systems. The quality of the service has deteriorated no end. We have a lot of people on the payroll. Many of them produce absolutely nothing when the day come, collect a salary at the end of the month, and make the most noise if their pay is late. I want to employ the Commissioner of Police. As you receive this and other kinds of additions to the system, that you look at the management system within the service and ensure that they are proper lines of accountability charcoal production is one of the main drivers of economic activity in cuba's guanahaka Bibis peninsula in the past they would usually make very little money but after the cuban revolution their craft was finally recognized their lives significantly improved after a restless night keeping the charcoal burning martial performs his flag raising ritual at the door of his cabin at 6 o'clock every morning. I've been working here for about 15 years now, and I always raise my flags. This is the oldest one, and now I was given a new one. I'm still missing a flag from Venezuela, but no one has brought me one yet. Marcial has been making charcoal since he was 18. His father taught him the trade. It might not be a glamorous job, but Marcial has a passion for it, and he knows all too well how coal miners lived in Cuba before. We live like kings now. I have cash to spend. Before I never had any. I feel good before they didn't pay and now they pay me well. I earn 11 or 12,000 pesos a month from the 10 to the 12 tons of charcoal I make. On the Los Cayuelos farm, we also met up with Jose Peña, who had left masonry behind and has been making charcoal for 12 years now. This is a difficult job in every sense, but the most difficult part for me as a charcoal maker is when you need to feed the fire in the furnaces. You have to get up several times throughout the night, three, four, even up to five times to feed the furnace fire. You can't stay in bed because if you oversleep, you'll lose the work. These men stay and make charcoal in the Los Cayuelos farm for months. It's one of the main exports in the territory and also a way to preserve the forests of Guanahasa Bibis. We are cutting off the branches that a tree doesn't need anymore, those that fell due to a cyclone, those that dried up. So in this way, we facilitate regeneration of the branches. Thanks to this pruning, next year they will produce more grapes. And these grapes feed the pigs, the deer, and all kinds of animals. 
We are making more or less seven or eight furnaces a month here. In the farm, 2,000 bags of charcoal produced last month are ready to go. This year, the forestry company plans to produce about 1,800 tons of charcoal, but the majority of it for export. And so life for these charcoal makers is not easy, but they remain in good spirits. Our greatest virtue is that we work too much. Fabiola López, Telesur, Península de Guanacabibes, Pinar del Río, Cuba. After the break, residents in India-controlled Kashmir resist security forces. Don't touch that remote. Who's moving the chess? What interests motivate the actors behind the Chivan? Se despliega el tablero. On critical moves. Investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the resort. Welcome back. Close to 100 Latin American refugees are living in tents on the streets of Paris, France, after being evicted from a disused factory they had been occupying. The migrants, which include pregnant women and about 20 children, are mostly from Colombia. They say they fled due to widespread violence in their homeland. They decided to settle in front of the St. Quen Town Hall in one of the poorest departments of France, pending a relocation solution from authorities, as the camp survives mainly through donations from organizations and neighbors. Me and my son left my country because of the violence, but never in my life have I experienced a situation as difficult as the one we are now experiencing in France. I ask the French government not to forget us. We are dignified, hardworking and responsible people. But without a roof over our heads, we cannot move forward. We cannot work. Residents in the Iranian port town where the Stena Empire British tanker is being detained are against foreign intervention in the region and have expressed their support for Tehran's adherence to maritime law. The Stena Empire crashed into an Iranian fishing vessel in the Strait of Hormuz and was subsequently detained on July 19th. The Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif held talks with the ship's owner yesterday about the case. The United States is leading a military mission in the Strait, supposedly for security reasons, considerably increasing tensions in the region. Germany refused to take part, frustrating Washington. Every reasonable mind would decide that it is not workable for the U.S. to come here from the other end of the world to safeguard the safety of the Strait of Ormuz. Therefore, countries like Iran, Iraq, and the Persian Gulf countries would be better to establish their own coalition to make the real security. The neighborhood of Sura, located in Indian-administered Kashmir, has become the epicenter of resistance against security forces. Thousands are protesting the decision by India to strip Jammu and Kashmir of its semi-autonomous status. Chanting freedom for Kashmir and India go back, citizens have taken to the streets every night to demand their region's independence. Residents have also built barricades and dug trenches to keep occupying forces at bay, sealing off their neighborhood from the rest of Srinagar. 
Many people have been injured, mothers, sisters and even children. They've come out of their houses to participate in the protests, to ask why our rights were taken away. This came out of the blue. They brought their forces overnight and they turned Jammu and Kashmir into a jail. Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh have refused to be repatriated back for fear of being tortured in Myanmar. The refugees said they would rather die in Bangladesh than return to their country. Authorities, along with the United Nations Refugee Agency, wanted to start repatriating them on Thursday. Almost one million Rohingyas fled Myanmar to neighboring Bangladesh after a military-led crackdown in 2017. With nothing but our lives, we came to Bangladesh. Here, we have shelter now. We have a little peace. Now, the Bangladeshi government and the UNHCR wants to send us back. Please, it is better to kill us here, but don't send us to the Myanmar of brutal people. Better to give us poison. I will die drinking that poison. I will take poison, but I will not go back. Sudan's new prime minister, Abdallah Hamdok, has been sworn in as leader of the transitional government. This comes after the swearing-in of military and civil members of the new sovereign council that will run the country for three years until an election. Freedom, peace and justice will form the program of the transitional period. Allow me to accomplish the central demands. The number one priority is to stop the war and build a permanent peace. We are working to alleviate the suffering of our people in refugee camps. Stopping war will also depend on resolving the dire economic crisis and building a national economy based on productivity and not on blessings and donations. That brings us to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.